such a little light thing. That's up to your imagination. You got a Grecian city, 250,000 free people, 400,000 slaves. You got the temple of Aphrodite down the road. They got a thousand priestess prostitutes. And you got pagan culture. And all of a sudden, one party in this group says, I'm Christian. We don't go to Aphrodite's temple anymore. We don't celebrate in the nine feast and the, the orgies. And we don't deal with a ritual prostitution anymore. And all of a sudden, this spouse says, Hey, I didn't sign up for that. Well, you've got a variety of things. So, divorce it is a biblical option. God allowed the, the children of Israel to divorce. And then you can divorce and remarry if one party, the offending party, is guilty of sexual immorality. So they've been sexually unfaithful to you. God says not only can you divorce, but you can remarry. And there's not a problem there. But at the same time, it doesn't have to be that. So all these things that we talked about are absolutely contributors. They're things that create the vulnerability for divorce. They create an atmosphere, but they don't cause it. Because divorce is something that people choose to do. Now, sometimes it's a mutual choice. Hey, we're, we're not going to do this anymore. Sometimes people get abandoned. Somebody says, I'm not happy. I'm not pleased. I fell out of love. One of the great myths about relationships is I fell out of love or I love you, but I'm not in love with you. That's like telling people, hey, I, I like you. I love you, but I don't like you. Well, no, you've got to have both those. Now, it, it may not be a, an emotional like, but I think like, like and love are always a choice. I think their attitudes are not emotions. Is that? Okay. Uh, my favorite definition for love is the, the one I always use, love, is the intentional, it's a choice word, love is the intentional, and if necessary, personally costly investment into the good of another. I'm making a choice to, even if it cost me pride points or pleasure, to make an investment into you because I want you to be the best you can be. Love is the intentional and, if necessary, personally costly investment into the good of another. It does not consider reciprocity or return on investment. Now, when you're dating, you kind of look in at return of investment, right? Right? Now, what do we mean by that? Hey, I'm doing something good for you. I expect you to do something good for me. If you get into a marriage that does not involve some reciprocity, that's not a marriage. That's not partnership. That's a project. Okay, biblical math, one plus one equals one. Not one plus one equals two. And one half plus one half doesn't equal a whole. If, if, if you're getting married because I'm broken and I have to have you to complete me, careful. Because that kind of energy can only be sustained for so long and then you start keeping score or you start feeling cheated. So in the dating process, you look for something that's reciprocal. You look for something that you mutually share. You look for a reciprocity. But once you say, I'm going to love you till death do us part, that commitment is not based on reciprocity. I don't get to treat you the way I treat you and use the way you treat me as a lever. You being rude doesn't give me permission to be rude. You being dishonest doesn't give me permission to be dishonest. You being hard to get along with doesn't give me permission to be, to, to be able to be to get along with and be difficult in that. So what, what manages our responses to other people's behavior? And, and really, you can't manage anything except your response to the other person's behavior. I, I can't control what you do. I can control how I respond to what you do. So love is the intentional and, if necessary, personally costly investment into the good of another. It doesn't really, at this point in marriage, worry anything about reciprocity. And it does not, it's not based on the fact that the other person deserves it. Love's a gift. 
It's an attitude. It's a choice. Anybody have very many dealings with two-year-olds? Are they easy to love? No. Do it myself. <laughs> and what is it, a gremlin? You know, I mean, all of a sudden, this sweet little cherub that you love the whole while it had hiccups becomes mobile and wants to be independent, and it's demonic. And then the same thing happens about the time that little girl turns 14. Cinderella becomes maleficent. <laughs> and all of a sudden, you know, a, a teenage boy's goal in life is to become an invertebrate. Look at the way they sit, <laughs> the way they walk. Okay? A teenage girl's goal in life is to prove that everything in the known universe is wrong. Okay, That's all she wants to do. Well, what do you do with these, with these teenagers and these toddlers? We love them. Why? They'll put us in jail if we don't? <laughs> no, it, it, it's a choice. We've got an attitude that says, I'm going to endure some stuff to help you become an adult. I'm going to endure some stuff to see you reach your potential. Well, that's the same thing I'm doing with my spouse. And so love is the intentional and, if necessary, personally costly investment into the good of another and really not dealing with what I get out of it. Although in the dating relationship, if you're not getting something out of it, you should stop dating. And then I, I really am going to love you on days that you're unlovable. And so when you start talking about divorce-proofing your marriage, look at the things that are make us vulnerable to not getting along. Look at the things that, that are, make us vulnerable to not being able to be one. So let's talk about intimacy. For this reason, a, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and the two shall become one. How do you achieve oneness? Because when you divorce, what happens to the one? It becomes divided. So if you know what makes oneness, you can avoid the dividedness, right? So tell me the things that, that contribute. We said, hey, this causes divorce. Well, now what contributes to oneness? What contributes to unity? What contributes to the things to where we think in terms of us and our rather than me and my? And by the way, I can sit with a couple in premarital counseling and listen to them talk, and if I hear I, me, my versus us, our, I can already tell whether it's going to be a good or a bad relationship because there's an usness that has to take place in a healthy relationship. So what contributes to connectedness? Communication. communication. Okay. Uh, ladies, how important is communication on a scale of one to five? Five being the most important, one being it's not important at all. Raise your hands and show me a number, how important communication is. Gentlemen, there's not a hand up that doesn't have a five on it. Okay? Now, what happens when you're dating each other? Jackie, you and Christy can't sit together if you don't cut up. All right. Okay, all right, okay. All right, that's, that's scary. Kyle, sit between them. <laughs> so when, you're, when, when, when guys and girls are dating, what's, what happens in that dynamic? Hyper-communicate. I like that. Because in the old days, you'd spend six hours with them, get home, and what would you do? Now what do we do? All that kind of stuff, right? Well, girls, females, build intimacy by talking. Men build intimacy by doing. We describe our friendships as a function of our activities. This is Bob. He's my best friend. We hunt together. We fish together. We golf together. We climb together. We bowl together. And a lot of the things that men do together aren't together. If me and Greg go hunting, we'll get up in the pre-dawn hours of the day. We'll drive out to the woods. He'll walk a mile that way. I'll walk a mile that way. And we'll spend six hours in utter isolation and silence. And we've hunted together. <laughs> Okay, now we text. We do sometimes text. But if you're texting during bow season, you'll get busted. I'm just telling you that right now. Don't ask me how I know that. But, we, we, but now we start dating and we go, hey, you want to go hunting with me? And you recognize that girls will do things with you that they really don't want to do? They'll just do stuff with you? 
And so they go sit in our golf carts or they ride in our boats or they watch us rebuild transmissions or they watch us play sports. Why? Because you're there. And on the way there, on the way back or during dinner, what do you do? You talk, talk, talk. So the guy goes home and tells his buddies, I've met the most wonderful girl. She'll go anywhere with me. She'll do anything and she looks better than you bones. And the girl goes home and tells her friends, I met the most wonderful guy. We can talk about anything. So intimacy starts with you guys sharing and exchanging each other's interest. I think one survey says that you have the same worldview, you have the same problem-solving method, and you have the same mythos. And mythos is that thing that, the thing that speaks to your heart speaks to my heart. Okay? So if she's in love with sunsets and you're not going to get up, that, that's not going to work very well. If you don't know the difference, ladies, between Star Trek and Star Wars, it's not going to work very well with some of these guys. And, and you learn to be interested in what the other person's interested in because what happens is it takes those layers of separation and it removes them so you're sharing in each other's lives, you're sharing in each other's likes, you're sharing in each other's pursuits. So one of the things that builds intimacy is communication and activity. Now, just think about... You've been married X number of years. How different does your communication and activity look now than it did when you were dating? And that's, that's up to you to think about. But if you're not continually fueling the fires for intimacy and connectedness, what tends to happen? He gets involved in work and she gets involved in nesting. And 18 years later, the nest is empty and you're in the house with a stranger that you don't like. Why? Because you haven't maintained the oneness. You haven't maintained, maintained this connectedness. Um, I use Jackie's volleyball a lot as an example when I'm traveling. And she's not in the room. But uh, she coached the large majority of her school coaching in middle school volleyball. Middle school volleyball. Middle school. Our daughter played Division I volleyball. She played club ball, Junior Olympic club volleyball. She played on an 18-year-old team when she was not 18. I've been to the Atlanta qualifier, 96 courts under one roof, and I've seen some serious volleyball. Not middle school <laughs> volleyball. Jackie, what's your record in middle school? Undefeated in regular season play. She lost a couple of city championships, but as far as day-to-day, -day, undefeated in regular season play. Which means her team was really, really, really well coached and really, really, really good. And this other bunch, the bad news bears with blindfolds. And I've watched a lot of those, those games. Why? Because middle school volleyball is not that stimulating. But I wasn't interested in middle school volleyball. I was interested in a middle school volleyball coach. And so I went because that was her passion, not necessarily because my passion. She's that way with hunting. She doesn't hunt. But she loves to walk in the woods and let me show her where I hunt so that if I don't come home, she knows which tree to look in. Or we sit down at the table. I go, you know, this deer we're eating tonight. She goes, let me guess. It was early in the morning, you were sitting in a tree, it walked by and you killed it. <laughs> Come to think of it, that's where all those stories end. <laughs> yes! <laughs> or you shot it and it didn't die immediately and you looked for it and you found it. <laughs> Thus it wouldn't be on the table. I get to think, man, this is pretty repetitive when I tell hunting stories. But she listens to those stories. We had some dear, dear friends at Memorial Parkway named Jim and Carolyn Beverly. Carolyn was a secretary or, or executive assistant for somebody in the missile defense program and they would send her to Kwajalein and, and she did this really highfalutin government job. Jim had a repair service truck that he fixed Caterpillar machines with. He could listen on the phone and tell you what was wrong with your Caterpillar. He ran a, a torch and a welder. He'd fire that welder up and go a dollar a minute because that's what he charged to weld. Him and Carolyn would come home and talk about what they did for work. And Jim would tell me, I don't understand the things she says. 
but I listened to her. Caroline told me one time, I don't know what Jim does at work. He tells me about all these actuators and lifts, and I go, oh, that's interesting. And they didn't understand a thing they were talking about, but they invested their time into each other. So we build intimacy by sharing. John Gottman will call this love mapping. Do I know what your favorite foods are? Do I know who your best friend is? Do I know what your favorite color is? Do I know what your favorite spot for a vacation would be if we could go anywhere and money wasn't an object? It's, it's how much do I know? Could I, could I look at you and map out your personality and do I know these things about you? We do that when we're dating. But what happens after we marry? Now what gets in the way? Life. Life is complicated and is a contact sport. So let's look at the cause or the genesis of conflict and, and see if we can answer what causes divorce, what causes intimacy. And, and this is kind of taken out of context. Wiggle it a little bit because I think things that are true vertically are also true horizontally. I mean, if I do a vector pull on a, with a rope, if I put a, a rope against that metal bar and stretch it to that metal bar and it's banjo string tight and I pull down on the middle of it, if the, if the angle of incident is 180 degrees, when I pull down, I put 575% of my weight on both those windows. Guess what happens to those bars? They come to the middle. Okay? When Batman shoots that dart and runs across it, that didn't happen. Okay, he's pulling chunks out of the wall. Well, guess what would happen if I took a rope and put it on the bumper of my truck and anchored it to the side of a building or, or around a tree and could get it banjo string tight and pull this way with it? Could I move my truck? Yeah, because the vector pull works the same way. You can play tug of war with, with, with two boys and say, you pull on this in the rope, you pull on this in the rope, and I'll pull the middle, I'll move you both. They go, no, you can't, and yes, you can. Because the same thing that is true vertically is true horizontally. And I think the same thing is true with things that work between us and God can probably be loosely applied to work between us and us. James chapter 4. James chapter 4 verse 1. What causes fights and quarrels among you. Now that's the New International Version. Anybody got a different question there? What causes fights and quarrels? What causes wars and fights? Okay, some of you fight and quarrel. Some of you war and fight. Anybody got anything different? Where do wars and fights come from? Where do wars and fights come from? All right. What's the question? I mean, that, what's the answer? Where, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from the desires that battle within you? So where does conflict come from? Now, I don't know when he's writing to the church if he talks about among your members. Some of the older translations have what causes wars and fights among your members. I don't know if he means between member to member or if it's inside the members of my body, what causes internal strife with me or if it's causing internal strife in the church or if it's both. Where do wars and fights among your members come? Is, is that person to person or, inter, or intrapersonal? I think it's both. Well, James says, when I have a, a source of conflict, what generates conflict? Our desires. Greg's translation says, your desire for pleasure. My translation just simply calls it desires. Now, what do we know about desire according to James the Apostle? Or James the brother of Jesus. James the Apostle is dead. I'm sorry. Well, so is this guy now. But anyway, when this was written, it was James the brother of Jesus. What does James say about desires? Go to James chapter 1 verse 13. It's interesting, if you read James, you'll get a, a pop-up balloon, and then he'll explore it later. And a pop-up balloon, and explore it later. 
James chapter 1, verse 13. What does he say about temptation? Where does temptation come from? Ah, where do... Don't let anybody say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God. God can't be tempted, doesn't tempt anybody. But everyone is tempted when we are drawn away and enticed by our own... What? Desires. Now, the older versions call it lust. Lust does not always have a sexual connotation. We're drawn away by the things that we desire. Uh, I like to illustrate lust as a desire that got cranked up on steroids. Got big, huge, and massive, and out of control, and powerful, and aggressive. So James says, hey, look, you're tempted to sin because of the things that you want. Now, it's not what you want, but simply that you have a capacity to want that makes you vulnerable to sin. And James will go ahead and talk about the sin cycle. Sin, when it's full grown, brings desire, brings on temptation. Temptation brings on sin. And sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. And the, the Greek word there for death literally means a stillborn baby, a non-viable entity. So James early says, hey, you know, you, you have trouble with temptation because of the stuff you want. Well, guess why you have trouble with me? Because of the stuff you want and the stuff I want. Why do you have trouble with your spouse? Same thing, because of the things that I want and the things that you want, and those things don't get together. So, so keep reading. Where do wars and fights and quarrels come from among you? Do they not come from the desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have. So you kill and you covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and you fight. So somebody said in our causal discussion, they said, hey, it's selfishness. How much selfishness is it described right there? So here I come into a relationship or I'm trying to maintain a relationship or I'm just trying to survive a relationship and I've got to think about the things that I want and I'm not satisfied and I'm not happy. And by the way, what causes dissatisfaction and unhappiness? Expectations. When life doesn't turn out like I expect it to, I suffer loss. And humans grieve all losses. If this is what I was expecting and this is what I got, I'm going to be dissatisfied at, at some level. You see the chicken sandwich picture at Wendy's and you go in and order it. Expectation. Reality. Okay? It, it, it's that kind of stuff. So, hey, I'm going to be married and it's going to make me happy. Really? Having a full-time 24-7 roommate who controls your diet is going to make you happy? <laughs> I'm not bitter. I'm healthy. Okay? <laughs> and so all of a sudden you start looking at the selfishness component and it's because we see these things out here that we want and they don't look like what we have so we decide we're not happy with them. Is the grass greener on the other side? But when I compare what I wish I had to what I have, what happens when you compare reality to fantasy? Who wins? Fantasy always wins. Every single time. Because I'm looking at this alternate scenario where I see myself involved or not involved or whatever, and I look at what I've got, and I tend to focus only on the negative, and I become covetous. I want that, not this. I want what you've got, not what I've got. And we, and we tend to not be satisfied with where we're at in life. And I think sometimes it's because of un, unrealistic expectations. Uh, read the characteristics for walking worthy as a Christian. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 1. I beg you as a prisoner of the Lord that you walk worthy of your calling. Well, what does it mean to walk worthy? It means that, that whatever label you've got, you, you match that label, okay? With lowliness and gentleness, forbearing one another 
endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. What does it mean to forbear? Patience. Now, what is the real definition for patience? The ability to stand up under pain. There, there's a recognition that there's some things that I'm going to be involved in that, that may hurt me, and I'm going to choose to stay in it. I'm going to choose to deal with it. I'm an imperfect person. I married an imperfect person. We gave birth to a person, and when she got old enough, she became imperfect. I live in a neighborhood of imperfect people. I go to church with imperfect people. I work with imperfect people. And I'm self-employed. <laughs> okay. Why do we lose our minds when an imperfect person lives up to their potential? Expectations. Well, I didn't think you'd act this way. Well, I thought you'd change. Well, I thought I could teach you better. I th what? It's this expectation, and I'm all of a sudden saying, this is what I've got, this is what I want, and it kind of gets into a borderline covetousness, a borderline dissatisfaction. So James says, you know, it's the things that you want. Now, we, we used to be friends with an old couple in Salem, Arkansas, Chuck and Helen Cowell. And they were the most interesting people because they were the first real Yankees I'd ever been around. And uh, Helen was kind of high strung and Chuck was sort of laid back, but he was very plain spoken. He might have been retired Air Force, maybe retired Navy. And he'd go, well, Helen wants this and Helen wants that. And I told her, you need to have your wants are fixed. <laughs> and we've used that in all our married life. At some point, you adjust your wanter and you're a little more satisfied. And so James says, where do these wars and these fights come from? They come from the things that you want and you can't have, and you fight and you, you kill and you covet and you can't get. He takes a little side note. He says, you don't have because you don't ask God. Well, maybe this applies to marriage and maybe it doesn't. If I'm dissatisfied in my marriage, what should I be praying about? Okay, maybe the marriage. My, my, myself. I heard a guy named Joe Beam. Uh, Joe was affiliated with the Churches of Christ for a long, long time. I'm not sure that he is anymore, but he runs a group in Nashville called Marriage Helper. He has some resources online that are free. He has some resources online that are pay to play, and he has a three-day seminar that, that you can go to called Marriage Helper. They boast an 80% uh, success rate. But Joe was teaching on prayer. And he said, if you picture that this room is the valley of prayer, prayer is contained by two canyon walls, that canyon wall and that canyon wall. On this canyon wall is God's law. On this canyon wall is a person's free will. God will not violate his law. And God will not violate your free will. If you don't violate God's law and you don't violate somebody's free will, you can pray about anything. So when I'm unhappy in my marriage and I start talking to God about you, God make them, God do, hey God help me to be patient, kind, the ability to forbear, to deal with imperfection, to have humility, to have gentleness, to have endurance. But we tend to either pray about the problem or we pray about the other person rather than praying about the only thing that we really have any ability to control. So James says, hey, you don't have some of these things because you don't ask. And I think one of the things is that, that we, we tend to ask God to change the other person. Did God solve the relationship conflict between the Israelites and the Egyptians. What did God say to Moses? He said, their cries have come up before me. The Israelites were saying, we're in this relationship with this other nation, and we're unhappy. Did God fix it? Yeah, he moved 4.2 million people across the desert. Lord, Lord we didn't, we, we, we thought, I don't like manna and quail. 
God didn't change the Egyptians into nice people. He said, I'm going to put you in a place where you're more in control of your own destiny. And that may be a bad example in a marriage class <laughs> because he let them leave. <laughs> but what happened is he didn't change the Egyptians, he changed the Israelites. And the Israelites were getting sucked into Egyptian culture because they don't spend 30 minutes in the wilderness and they want their own God made out of gold. And so God had to get them away from some of that. But in this, hey, you have these unhappiness and you have this dissatisfaction and you fight with each other because of your selfishness. And he says, you know, you don't have some of these things because you don't ask. And when you do ask, verse 3, you do it to receive because you want to, you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives that you may spend it on your own pleasures. He says, look, if, if you're in a situation and, and, and your prayers are about your selfishness rather than learning and growing and maturing, maybe that's a foul. I say, Lonnie, why in the world did you choose James chapter 4 as the outset in a marriage class? Look at the next verse. Somebody read that next one for me. Okay, so when James says you've got this dynamic that happens between you and God and you're selfish and you're covetous and you're having all these conflicts, what does James call these people? Spiritual adulterers. He says you've violated the sanctity of your covenant with God because you've, you're looking at something that's an alternative relationship rather than finding out what this relationship is supposed to be like. And, and so James says that, that the cause of this unhappiness starts with our deciding whether or not we're going to be friends with what God wants us to be friends with or whether or not we're going to be friends with what we want to be friends with. In your marriage, everything you say yes to is something else you say no to. And everything you say yes to brings friends to the party. So you've got to start asking, hey, what am I saying yes to when it comes to my selfish desires versus my spouse's needs? Because when I start stop addressing your needs when I stop addressing you as the most important, when I stop trying to be in a, in a relationship where my view of you... Remember how you treated people when you were dating them? I drove 10 hours out of the way on my way home from a gospel meeting to see Jackie on her birthday the summer before we got married. I drove from Alexander City, Alabama to Cloverdale, Indiana, did a, a seven-day meeting. The elders at the church knew it was Jackie's birthday. They said, if you need to take a couple of days to go see that girl in Arkansas, that's cool. And so on my way home from Indiana, I drove 10 hours out of way to go to Velvet Ridge, Arkansas and see her on her 17th birthday. Honey, would you stop by a Kroger and get some... Honey, that's not on my way home. <laughs> I don't want to stop at McDonald's after I've been hunting to bring home, you know, and I drove 10 hours out of the way to visit her when we were dating. Where'd that dude go? So you start thinking about, hey, did I behave selfish or selfless when we first put this thing on track? And so the initial part of, hey, where do wars and fights come from among you? They probably start with selfishness. And I wouldn't say it's a cause of divorce, but I would say it's one of the major contributing factors is that when I'm selfish, I can't be trusted. When you can't trust me, we don't have intimacy. And when we don't have intimacy, I don't reach that place where I choose love as an attitude over an emotion. I t then tend to let my emotions guide my interactions with you and emotions are fickle and terrible things. But if the uh, attitude, I can treat you as if you're forgiven. I can treat you as if we're friends. I can treat you as if I love you. That's an attitude. But if you've got selflessness that builds trust, that builds intimacy, 
the, the pinnacle thing where you've got this attitude of love is a natural byproduct of that kind of living. All right, I see kids wandering in the fellowship hall, so I think maybe a bell has rung that I didn't hear. Any, any questions, comments, things we need to clear up? All right, thank you guys. Look forward to it next week. Uh, here's some cards that you can invite folks. Thank you all for coming to the class.